Hello, everybody. We should hopefully be ready now. Uh, can everyone hear me now? Can you just confirm one more time? Okay, great. So we all seem to be okay. Um, okay, I'm going to catch up on, on the time that we've missed on. Uh, once again, my apologies for the delay. But my computer's just crashed a few times. Um, I'd like to um, maybe just wait for FX Street. Just let me know if we're ready to go. Uh, in terms of logistics, and, and then I'll um, I'll get started. The visuals okay? Okay, I shall go ahead. Okay, now um, I've just removed the chat from the screen, so um, so uh, it's easier for everyone just to see the screen and for the recording purposes of Epic Street. Um, I'll start now. Um, Happy New Year, everyone! Belated uh, Happy New Year. Um, I think the Chinese New Year has just missed, but it's, it's been a long time also um, in my giving uh, webinars to FX Street, and I'm uh, honored uh, to be back uh, uh, sharing um, uh, some knowledge and, and learning as much as possible from each of the participants that attend uh, my webinars. I've been giving webinars now for FX Street for a number of years, but just took a, a break um, over the last few months. So the first thing I'll begin by saying is uh, this webinar, um, uh, scheduled for Thursday, uh, the 13th February, um, or, uh, 1 p.m. GMT. Um, my name is Ron William, and um, I'm currently uh, speaking uh, or working on behalf of uh, market analyst uh, as an international business development manager and market strategist. Um, if you want to email me um, with any questions after this session, please email me on my work email. That's ron.william at market-analyst.com. Um, and in time, I hope to be uh, updating some blog um, information on the forexstreet.net. Uh, uh, they have a fantastic uh, blog, uh, which is growing every day. So I hope to participate at some point on to that. Okay. Now, some of you might also remember me from uh, my previous seminars um, when I, um, under under the, my private advisory firm, RWA Market Advisory, um, that is still active, um, and I, I do publish some research under that uh, brand. And hence, um, um, I'm just showing with you this quick disclaimer, uh, just in, in terms of uh, some of the views that I might share uh, during this session and particularly the premium session afterwards, uh, which will focus more on market outlook. It's, it's all for educational purposes only, um, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, within that context. Now, a little bit about myself, uh, for those of you that m might not already be aware, so some of you maybe who hadn't attend, attended my sessions before, um, I've been in the market for officially just over 15 years. It's been... Um, a humbling 15 years where I've, I've learned a lot. And I think the more I learned, that the, the more I realized that there is still so much more um, work and research to be done within this uh, wonderful field of market analysis. Now, I began um, uh, early on uh, in terms of my professional career. I got started quite young. Um, and, and at that early age, uh, what I realized uh, through my mentor at the time, although I didn't, I wasn't as sure um, back then, uh, was this whole idea of the cyclical nature of markets. And this ties in very well with, with, with our webinar today. Now, um, it, it through that through that experience uh, from way back then until now, it's been the uh, the core part of my own methodology, and certainly I would say a flagship. Um, focus area specialization for the company that I now work at at Mark Downs. Um, now, in terms of a little bit about myself and, and my analysis, like I said, I've been in the market for about 15 years. Um, a lot of my methodology has been predicated through cycles, so that the timing of markets, but also understanding the big picture um, uh, cycles and, and just the roadmap uh, that exists in the market. So just think of yourself getting in the car and driving from point A to point B, it's wonderful to, to have a, a roadmap in your hand to actually just identify um, the path that you might be driving along. Um, and so within that, within that context, um, I've always kind of focused on, on this upside-down pyramid that you're looking at, 
this top-down approach uh, where you begin with the macro, the big picture, looking at the cycles in terms of long-term history, in terms of history of feeding itself, in terms of pattern identification, um, and also in terms of intermarket correlations between each uh, each and every market. So that that's all the top part of this macro analysis. And then on the second level, on the, once you drill down, it's more about market internals so within the stock market, the breadth analysis, you know, how much of that market is participating in that rise or fall, um, and, and, and many other measures that you might look at uh, in terms of indicators or measurement of sentiment and so on. Uh, now, timing, um, and I say timing in, in terms of the short-term trade setup timing, uh, this is also very important, and um, everyone has a number of, of their own trade setups. Um, some people use candle patterns. Some people use uh, various quant- uh, quantitative methods. My, my focus area has always been um, using short-term cycles, but but then also overlaying that with uh, candle uh, pattern set- sentiment and uh, the use of uh, Tom DeMarc's uh, indicators, which we've had used for many years. So that's a little bit about myself. My main focus has been cycle analysis, and um, I, I generally fit it in within this model here that I'm showing you macro analysis, market internals, and then short-term timing for the trade setups. Now, um, this has is, this is traditionally been a global webinar, um, and, and this is one of the, the great honors um, that, that I've enjoyed over the years in, in actually participating in these webinars. Um, and what I'd like to do is to make them as interactive as possible. It, it really is a two-way um, learning curve, um, and, and so I'd like to really uh, encourage each of you here, uh, who I know that are attending from across the world, from different countries around the world, to participate on, on this next slide, uh, which uh, where I'm going about, about to ask you a question, and, and then also throughout the session. So my opening question is, please, can you introduce yourselves uh, to each other? Uh, just, just specify which country you're, uh, you're attending and uh, maybe what markets you're most interested in, what type of strategy you'd like to use. And what I'll do is I'll open up the chat so we can all get a good idea of, of the participation there. So we have Forex Girl from USA, Florida, uh, looking at futures and FX. Vincent Fong from Melbourne, Australia. So we have some, uh, this is just across, from, across the world here, India. Uh, Sangiva, hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Joji, um, uh, John from Bangalore, India. Krishna Rao from Singapore, who looks at Forex. Pan of Fire, who looks at UK gold, oil, Aussie euro, sterling yen. Vincent Wong, who looks at Forex. Joseph Trader uh, from England, looking at four hour charts and more of a short term. Hugo Jensen from Denmark, looking at FX. Saudin Robovic, New York, USA, looking at Forex. Um, Robert. Uh, looking at UK, uh, from the UK, looking at FX and, and price action classic um, analyst. Uh, Sahid from the UK, looking at forks and indices. And then I'll, I'll wrap up here. Um, uh, Tsefet from Johannesburg, South Africa. Ricky from Singapore, looking at FX and equities. Uh, Vitoreo from Singapore. And uh, Jerome from the Netherlands. And then finally, Carlos from Charlotte, North Carolina. Carolina. We have a, a big mix. I, I don't want to miss the, the, the last two. Brussels, uh, Vlad from Brussels, and then uh, MRC from Budapest. We have um, a rich diversity of, of um, attendees. I'm quite impressed. Um, and hey, I, I really uh, encourage all of you to enjoy this session. It's going to be quite a uh, I, I hope constructive and interesting session on, on the cyclical nature of, of um, uh, markets. Uh, there is a lot of there's a lot that I would love to cover in in this session, but I'm, I basically chose uh, some of the best parts, um, focusing quite a lot on theory, um, and then there'll be a, a, a little bit on on the practical side of things, um, which I hope to expand on on the premium session for those of you that signed up for uh, the part two of this um, within the market. Outlook. So if I could just get a, a quick um, uh, gauge, how many of you actually have attended my webinars before, um, which which I gave some time ago? Okay, so there's, there's, there's uh, a, a, okay, so a few, 
a few yeses, a few noes. Um, if you've been, if you attend my webinars before, uh, welcome back. Um, uh, sorry for the long delay uh, break that I took out. And for those of you um, uh, that are new to this, uh, enjoy and and um, I value your feedback and any questions that uh, all of you might have. Feel free to to ask questions. So welcome to all of you. Uh, my big uh, mantra has always been enlightenment through realized knowledge, and, and knowledge is always a two way thing. So. Enjoy the uh, session, and uh, let's get started. Okay. Now, I always like to begin with the end in mind, um, so I'd like to kind of give you an idea of what we're going to cover. Uh, part one is focusing on, on, on the history of technical analysis. So why is it important in life and in, and in uh, markets? Why is timing important? the history and importance of cycles. Um, I'm a big uh, believer in, in learning from history uh, and learning from our ancient history. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to kind of begin this as to just touch very briefly upon the how ancient civilizations look at cycles, um, all the way to modern theory in terms of um, a lot of the uh, grandfathers of cycle theory um, in the early 20th century. And this is just to provide a little bit of context to the history, just so you can maybe maybe get a better story or better context as to how cycles was can be used now based upon how it was used then. So um, for some of you, this might be interesting information. Some of you might think, well, hey, when are we going to jump to the charts and and, and we'll do that uh, towards uh, towards the middle and end of, of of the session. But there's a connection here, and I hope to 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 to, to make those connections for you by beginning at the very start of, of the history of psychoanalysis. So that's all part one. Part two is more cycle uh, theory. Um, and uh, I just make some very simple points about different types of cycles that we can measure in the market. Um, and this is mainly price cycles. Um, I had hoped to include business cycles, and economic cycles, and so on. But a lot of this is interrelated. So I'll, I'll be focusing more on, on the theory of cycle, but it, it can be applied on all markets. This is multi-asset class uh, applicable, uh, but also economic um, uh, theory, economic cycles. If you're thinking of the US GDP um, or if you're thinking about economic growth, uh, stock market cycles and so on, um, and many other um, things that you might want to measure. Um, I also talk about, uh, just very briefly, GAN's law of vibration, uh, uh, GAN or what it means GAN is... Uh, prominent um, cycle uh, specialist, uh, uh, well-known specialist uh, in this field, but we also combine cycles with uh, geometry and many other uh, overlays. But I mentioned, I mentioned his theory just so you can maybe um, think, have something to consider, something extra to consider. But this won't be a, a GAN um, training session. It's just very um, broad coverage on, on cyclical nature of markets. Part three um, is more the market application. And, uh, and I, again, I talk about the different types of cycles and, and give you some market examples, which hopefully I should be able to pull up on this PowerPoint and um, on uh, the charting application, market analyst charting application, which I have on the PowerPoint. Okay, so part one, two, and three. We'll get started now. Now, uh, what I want to do is actually start off by uh, encouraging each of you to actually uh, participate at the very beginning. So I, I like to know uh, where each of these, each of uh, each of you as delegates are are coming from, and which markets you like to focus on. But then also, I like to connect that in terms of your interests and your your thought processes in with this thing by asking you the question: um, How important is timing to you? Question one. Question two, what do you believe cycles are? If, if each of you could, could maybe just share your answers here, how important is timing to you um, in market analysis, in your trading? Um, and then the second question, what are cycles? Um, so if anyone could just start off with sharing some feedback on that. How important is timing to you? And what, what do you believe cycles are? So Joe is saying timing is critical. Um, why would you say that, Joe, if you could just give me a quick 
why, why would timing be critical to you and, and, and to, to most people? If you could just give me an example. I know it's a really simple question that I'm asking, but, but just to get the ball rolling and, and get everyone on, on the same page. So Joe or, or anyone else, why would timing be critical, as, as Joe just mentioned? Don't need precision, um, uh, but but it's good to know that you're within, within a wave. That's a very good point. So maybe you don't have to uh, be perfect on that exact timing on that particular day or that particular minute, but knowing which stage you are in the cycle can be very relevant. Uh, Joe's also saying is draw, draw, drawdown is stressful for me. So maybe timing can help manage risk. That's a great point. Um, it's not just about calling the top in the market or the bottom of the market, but it can also equally be as useful as managing risk. Uh, Forrest Gar saying time is crucial to enter a trade um, or have good luck and cycles um, repeat. So there's, there's, this, there's this idea of history repeating itself and, and hence the cyclical nature of markets is, is illustrated through uh, patterns, historical patterns repeating. Um, Jerry saying what goes up must come down. That's that's a great point. Um, the word I use for that is duality. I, I talk about that theoretically in terms of um, the symmetry of the market, the duality of the market, in the sense that you have this yin yang energy in the market. Uh, a rise uh, must be followed by a fall and vice versa. And so when you accept that, you realize that the market markets are truly cyclical. Um, Krishna is saying not to be caught on the wrong side, certainly. Um, so you might be a trend follower. A trend follower is – being a trend follower is great, and, and most statistical analysis prove that trend following can be a very highly uh, profitable and, and successful strategy. But a trend is only um, uh, successful until it, it exhausts and, and then rever- uh, uh, reverses and ends ultimately. So it trends your friend until it ends. Knowing when it ends is quite important and quite uh, is one of the big advantage points of, of uh, using cycle analysis. So great feedback, guys. I'm, I'm going to try and keep in all the, all the other points um, that have been buzzing in the background in just one second. So trend trend following, but then identifying where that trend's going to end through cycle analysis. Um, then Robert saying entry is important, certainly. Um, so knowing the turning points in the market. Entry and exit, I would say. Um, Daniel uh, Fuller is saying time is important to know how long the pattern will last. Absolutely. So that time duration, uh, which is great. And I'll, I'll talk about long-term cycles, secular cycles, which, which are otherwise known as generational cycles. Um, so that's, that's also useful information, uh, particularly in the current market. Uh, Hugo is saying the difference between winning and losing, certainly. Uh, although I would say your trade setup is and your risk management and management is also important within that context. Um, and then just, just to wrap up, timing depends on if you're long term or short term and in long term I feel fundamentals matter more than technical analysis. Um, I understand that point, uh, but I, I shan't comment on that yet. Uh, Joe says I've been studying her cycles. I won't be covering her cycles, but that's, that's interesting to note. We can maybe exchange emails um, afterwards. Um, and then Pam saying, uh, amount of trade determines stops and time and position needs depending on money risk. Uh, and then I think that's it, really. Uh, Mason saying, if timing is wrong, everything will be wrong. Uh, quite a simple but very profound point, and, and I agree with that. Uh, in, in, in experience, I've found timing is, is truly everything in the market. And then finally... Melmar, I look for history of a wave that predicts either bullish or bearish timing, uh, which follows. So it sounds like each of you are, are advocates of cycle analysis, which is great. Uh, very last uh, uh, read I'll, I'll, I'll give out just to make sure that everyone's getting heard. Vlad is saying timing, very important for patterns. See first when others see uh, what others might see eventually. Understanding the product market does not mean that you will make money. On the products market, you may, uh, you, your, your understanding might be too late. So, a great, uh, diversity of, um, feedback and, and thought processes, and it's great. Yeah, we started off, uh, step by step where a few people were, uh, sharing their feedback, and now we had a whole kind of tidal wave of, of, um, of useful information. So, thank you very much. I really value and appreciate your feedback, and, and please keep it coming.
but this is a great way to kind of really get the ball rolling uh, before we even start the session, just to really kind of all of us to collectively share our ideas um, and just try and ground it you know, onto kind of one level playing field so that we can all have an idea and feel for where we're all coming from and how that might also kind of feed through into this one central theme of uh, the cyclicality of markets, so the very nature of, of uh, how markets move um, each day. So that's how important timing is to you, and then that helps answer some of the questions as to why cycles are important and, and maybe why you're attending this seminar in the first place, um, that this webinar that we're having. Now, I'm going to start right at the beginning and just talk more about the importance of timing in the very traditional sense. I mean, we're, we're surrounded by time. We're consumed by it. I mean, from, from the word go, um, time is, is, is everything. And so we have clocks telling us what time it is. Uh, we have our watches. We have our alerts now. We're, we're now inundated with alerts, email alerts or, or PDA, um, mobile cell phone uh, alerts. Uh, we have alarm to wake up to. We have our whole day, which is scheduled, uh, be it work-related or be it trade-related and so on and so forth. So time is really important uh, in the traditional sense. Um, and time is made so much more easier nowadays with technology. Now, now you can just have um, a clock that tells you exactly what time. But that, of course, wasn't the case um, uh, many centuries ago. So maybe timing is something that we take for advantage to some degree. But either way, uh, the point here is that timing is very important. We're consumed and surrounded by this big need uh, to know what time it is and to, 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 to understand different timing windows within our, our own lives, whether it's uh, profession, for professional reasons or for personal reasons. Now, I just want to take a step back and just talk about timing from, from a um, from a universal standpoint, uh, from an earthly, uh, mother nature standpoint, um, timing is, 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 is the essence in, of, of how our days begin. So we wake up in the morning and it ha and we wake up usually depending on which time zone we're in when the sun rises. So the sunrise has a very symbolic start of the day and a very cyclical, um, uh, nature of, of, of the day um, and so here's a picture of a sunrise um, uh, along the sea um, something that, that we, we see every day um, and, and something that's very important because it, it marks the start of the day um, and so just some very simple basics, uh, not looking at clocks and just focusing on the symbology here, this is, this is a, an earthly um, mother nature um, signal um, of the start of the day, the sunrise. And of course, the, the opposite or the duality of the sunrise, the sunset, but then of course, at the, after, after a sunset, we have the moon rising or the full moon. And so here we have a full moon signaling, uh, the beginning of, 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 uh, of evening, evening time, dusk, um, and nighttime. Um, and then of course, that, that then becomes the duality, this relationship between the sun, and the moon, the sun in the morning, the sunrise, the sun set, and then the moon actually then rising to, the, to its full um, uh, brightness, then signaling nighttime. Um, and each of these planets govern our day and govern our night. Um, and, and it has been that way since the beginning of time. Um, and so a lot of ancient civilizations just studied this very basic phenomenon uh, between these two planets, sun and the moon. Now, of course, the significance of, 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 um, of uh, time in, in, in the earthly sense is um, the seasons that we experience uh, every year uh, and always have done. Uh, we, we have uh, spring season, summer season, autumn season, winter season. Um, and each year we, 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 we run through this, this cyclical seasonality in life. Um, and of course, depending on where we're living, um, around the world, each of you, are, um, are, are coming in from, from many different countries from around the world, uh, will be experiencing different seasons according to where your location is, um, in the world, um, on earth. Um, so, so timing has this very profound 
influence on 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 the actual uh, seasonality of of uh, of our year, and of course the weather conditions that come with that, um, and and then many other things, our, our calendar, um, and and, uh, and many things within that context. So I just want to make that that, that simple point: uh, the seasonality, the the cyclical seasonality of the year. Now, just a quick kind of technical point here for those of you that might be interested and, and also to focus on this point of, of planetary um, influence and importance, um, just to connect the dots. Of course, our the cyclicality of our seasons is dictated by the position of uh, Earth uh, and the Sun. Uh, and of course, here you can see the... Uh, uh, that shift, that the, the, the different stages here, uh, as as the Earth runs through these seasons. So you have, for example, the uh, uh, two uh, equinox on uh, evenings, where you have the vernal equinox, the first day of spring in the northern heaven, he, uh, hemisphere. Um, then we shift um, uh, anti-clockwise. Uh, the summer uh, solstice, which is um, very well known. First day of summer in the northern hemisphere, so as the, as the Earth um, basically um, uh, shifts around in, a, in an anti-clockwise fashion around the sun, um, and then it rotates into the uh, autumnal equinox, the first day of autumn in the northern hemisphere, and then finally full circle or full cycle uh, to the winter solstice, the first day of winter in the northern hemisphere. So the sun and the Earth have this cyclical. Um, progression relationship and that actually from if, if we were to kind of take a step out into the universe and see how this actually happens from a mechanical or universal standpoint this is this is how it happens now this this also then just just makes the highlights the relevance of the universe the solar system that actually we're um, we're surrounded by it's an infinite um, uh, space of stars and planets um, that we uh, are surrounded by uh, and always have done since the beginning of time. And so I just, I'm just going to make the point here that, that of course, a lot of these uh, planets and a lot of this cosmic universe, uh, this infinite cosmic universe, has an influence uh, on, on everything. Think of it as a big ecosystem. Um, and of course, the Earth and the Sun and the Moon these are some of the main planets that we know, but of course there are many other planets, um, and each of them have some kind of interconnectivity with each other. Um, we can only but but uh, assume that that is the case uh, just just because of, of, of the nature of uh, of their makeup and very very scientific research, which is, um, has has been studied in, in this area. But also keeping in mind the importance of the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon, we, we can just but 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 assume that there is so much. Uh, equal or more significance to these planets as well. Now, of course, the ancient civilizations um, had a, had a wonderful respect, a very rich respect for uh, for time, <clears throat> and specifically for um, for this cosmic universe that we are surrounded by, um, and so and and the relevance to that within their very lives. So, I I want to make that point so we can kind of trace back in history and just maybe understand a little bit about that. I won't talk too much about this, but just enough just to get a flavor of the importance of cycles in life and in markets. Now, when we think of ancient civilizations and time, the most popular thought in our mind is, is uh, the ancient Mayan civilization and their famous Mayan calendar. And of course, this became even more of a top headline um, into 2012, where uh, a lot of people were expecting some kind of Armageddon uh, shift in civilization, which which didn't happen. Fortunately, we're still alive and well and breathing, smiling. Um, but but they had this this um, amazing technology, basically, many thousands of years ago, that was able to um, basically precisely uh, time uh, calendars and uh, moments uh, throughout the day. Uh, almost as accurately as the current atomic clock that we have now. Um, so we're talking about precise, precise technology that was able to um, identify exact moments in time. 
And then, of course, long term um, uh, timing windows so, uh, such as a multi thousand year old calendar, which which um, spoke of an important cyclical uh, shift in 2012. Um, now, uh, most there's another school of thought that didn't see it as a negative or an Armageddon uh, shift, but more as a duality of shift from one uh, season to another season. Think of the uh, Earth's seasons of spring, summer, winter, and autumn. Um, there is a growing thought that the Mayan calendar was focusing more on this shift, this, this uh, uh, big, big, big shift um, between one season to another shift uh, to another season in 2012. But that's for those of you who are interested, the Mayan calendar or the Mayan civilization tends to be up there at the top on the list in terms of um, very interesting um, themes when people talk about ancient civilizations and their understanding of cycles. But then, of course, um, uh, we have other civilizations, um, other famous civilizations, and then ancient Egyptians uh, are very famous for studying um, cycles. Um, and this is a, a picture of the Temple of Isis, um, the ceiling of the Temple of Isis, which you can now find in the Lourdes Museum um, in uh, Paris. So their uh, uh, main museum in Paris. Um, where many flock to see the art and, and, the, and the famous uh, Mona Lisa painting. You can actually go in there in the, in the Egyptian section, um, the ancient Egyptian section. You can also see the ceiling of the Temple of Isis. Now, on the ceiling of the Temple of Isis, it, it's, it's basically a, a homage, an honoring of uh, many planetary uh, movements and, and zodiac uh, symbology, but basically this this is uh, this was a very integral part of their lives, and so many of the pharaohs and many of the astrologers or the astronomers of, of that time uh, would um, would actually carve out uh, hieroglyphic um, uh, outlines of um, of the planets of of the cyclical nature uh, of the planets and and maybe some of their uh, symbology. So this is this is um, screenshot of that, which um, uh, the real thing is actually now in, in the uh, French Museum in Paris. Now, again, I want to take a step back here and now talk more about the duality of the cycle. So the, the very nature of the cycle is uh, there is a beginning and there is an end. There is a yin, there is a yang in the Chinese philosophy. Um, and that, that's what this picture illustrates here. Um, and, and this is the very point of cyclicality, and, and, I, and I want to switch from cycles quickly to, to markets in, in this particular slide, and, and this point that I'm making, I make the point that this is why cycles are so important, because we often talk and live and trade in a linear world um, or a linear thought process. We believe that uh, what has existed for um, a certain amount of days, weeks, months, even years – uh, will continue forever. And so we, we just have this, this perception or this misperception, in my opinion, of linear trends. Um, and it's partly behavioral uh, in the sense that as human beings, we have this, this human trait, this human um, uh, uh, expectation uh, of things uh, continuing forever. Um, and it's kind of like being in a car, driving forward, and looking through the rearview mirror and always seeing the same road behind you. At some point, you're going to hit a curve. At some point, you're going to take a turn, left or right. There's going to be a T-junction of some sort. Um, I just want to quickly just jump to um, some of the chat because there, there's been some few comments here. Uh, Robert saying, um, I have uh, perfect cycles when I buy, it sells. Uh, when I buy, it sells. And when I sell, it buys. It's turning into a real cycle. Um, sounds interesting. Uh, Robert also saying, uh, um, and then uh, Victoria saying, you mean no more taper? Good point. So, if to, on, on to more thematic uh, examples, quantitative easing is is a is an economic trend that everyone's been expecting to continue to continue forever, or governments have maybe been uh, expecting to continue forever. Obviously, we're seeing tapering now and unwinding, um, uh, and and so that's been a shift in the economic. Um, uh, monetary policy, uh, which will have, which will and probably is already having uh, an impact on markets. So, 
So yes, uh, there are many changes, and that that also includes economic uh, policy as well. So the duality of cycles, and that's the main point here. Um, what what has a beginning has an end, um, and every market that rises will fall, and vice versa. So that there are, there are two sides to every coin, to every story, and to every market. And this is something that ancient civilizations recognized very early on, thousands of years ago. And if I just um, shift to the next slide, um, staying on the uh, topic of the ancient Egyptians, a lot of their symbology, and I'll show you the ancient Greeks and, and the ancient Romans as well, just to give more of an inclusive um, story, um, focused on the duality of cycles and the duality of, of, of luck um, and everything that they did. And so the ancient Egyptians um, had, had many symbols, and one of their most uh, premium uh, and auspicious symbols is the symbol of the scarab. And a lot of the um, uh, respected uh, pharaohs, ancient Egyptian pharaohs, would wear a scarab around their neck or on, on various um, uh, royal jewelry, uh, on the crowns um, that they would wear on their head. Um, and <clears throat> if you look up the symbology of a scarab, a scarab is basically a, a beetle. Um, and, uh, and it was recognized early on in ancient Egyptian history um, uh, as to how um, the, the, the scarab would be born um, uh, in, in a very unique way, uh, as if it would be born from, from its, uh, from, uh, let's say, the ashes um, uh, and in, in a very unique way. I won't say any more than that. You can look up the story and, and get more of that. Uh, detailed version of, of, of the symbology of the scarab, but but the scarab is basically a, a symbol of um, uh, let's say birth from death. It's this kind of duality uh, between uh, life and death. Now this is also very uh, very eloquently illustrated in the legend of the phoenix, and this is a Greek legend where they had this mythological legendary phoenix. Uh, that, that typically would rise from the ashes. So in order for the phoenix to actually uh, be born, it would need to be born from its predecessor's ashes. So there would need to be some kind of um, creative destruction, a um, uh, nice kind of term which later on became popularized by um, a gentleman called jo- Joseph Schumpeter, who I'll be talking about shortly, um, um, basically talks about the, the, the duality of cycles, but then also this fact that through good and bad and, and yin and yang, that, that we have this duality that exists. Um, and so the Greeks also focused on, on, on this symbol through their legend um, of a phoenix rising from the ashes. Um, now, to, 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 to round this off and make it very con- uh, conclusive and, and include some of the key uh, ancient civilizations. Of course, the Romans, the most uh, modern of, of ancient civilizations, um, uh, uh, spoke about um, the, the duality of uh, of, 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 of uh, their god, Janus, and they would have a beginning and an end, and hence our month of, of the year, first month of the year, January, is actually named after the Roman god, Janus. Um, and, and so they, they also focused on that. Now, moving on to modern uh, um, uh, cycle um, uh, theorists, the work of Joseph Schimpeter spoke about this creative destruction. So here um, we have a, a modern 19th, uh, 20th century um, theorist that actually spoke about this um, this, this point here uh, of um, every every civilization, every market going through this transition. Um, now, the way that uh, his cycles were, were later to be used is through this three-cycle schema. Uh, and this is how cycles should be used, whether you uh, follow the works of Schumpeter or, or other cycle theorists. Keep in mind that cycles are generally best used in threes and in terms of increasing the probability of, of that, that signal that, that, you, that you're um, looking for um, and, um, and just gaining the fuller picture of the moves in the markets. So... Um, I'll, I'll go into um, how these cycles can be combined, but just keep in mind that there's this, this model of a three um, uh, uh, schema, three cycle schema. 
uh, we have the long term, medium term, and short term cycles. Um, around a, a, a similar time frame, we, we had the works of uh, Nikolai Kondratiev, um, and he spoke more about these very, very long term uh, cycles in, in, uh, in, uh, in inflation, uh, commodities, um, and how they would trigger um, also uh, wars. So there was this revolutionary cycle throughout history. And, and this is very long-term stuff I'm talking about, but I'm just, again, just, just fast-forwarding from the ancient civilizations into um, the modern cycle theorists and how they applied it, uh, not only to markets, but also to, um, to, to, uh, well, to, to war cycles, to um, uh, inflation, deflationary cycles, and, and things that are very relevant uh, nowadays. Um, this is more of a, um, again, built on the model of Radio, but now focusing more on innovation. So we have uh, technological innovation cycles where we begin um, in the um, uh, 1900s, basically, or sorry, 1800s, where we begin with uh, railway um, uh, technology and then we shift from railway to, um, to transport, to, to upgrade the transportations, um, the train and uh, cars and and then many other things. Think of the uh, transistor radio, the computers, um, and many other things. Um, so here, for example, I'm just going to show you the most recent one, if you can just see the chart, between the 1990s and 2000 was very much part of an information technology uh, cycle that we shifted in from. Um, and this is a chart just showing you how the, uh, the uh, innovation cycles have shifted all the way back from the 1700s right until now um, into the uh, 21st century. Um, Edward Dewey is an important um, uh, cycle theorist that, that I encourage each of you to, to look up if you really want to study um, uh, classic cycle theory. Um, and um, Edward Dewey, back in the 1930s, was encouraged by the, um, the U.S. government to basically research and investigate the reasons behind the Great Depression. Uh, so, of course, if you put yourself back then and rewind back in time, uh, we had the Wall Street crash, which was a very traumatic uh, financial market occurrence. Um, and from that, we had the, uh, the seeds of the Great Depression. And it, it was a, a point of, um, it was a very difficult time. Um, and so a lot of people asked the questions as to the causality of, of these events so that they could maybe prevent it in the future. But in the end, if you, if you look up um, Edward Dewey's uh, research and, um, and work, a lot of it can be found in the foundation of the study of cycles. It's a society that actually um, archives a lot of Edward Dewey's work. He's also published a book, of course, that you can read. Um, in, in his research, uh, he, he found a lot of natural cycles, um, which uh, feeds through to, uh, to, to everything around us and on, on, on Earth, um, but also um, uh, the very markets that we trade. So there's this, there's this strong connection between natural cycles and, um, and, and market cycles that we study. And of course, last but, but by no means least, uh, and I'm just mentioning a few prominent names here, the work of William Gann, who, who was very much a market uh, uh, trader, um, uh, but also a prolific researcher. Um, and for many years, uh, he would study the... Uh, the combination of price and time um, through his law of vibration. Um, and his, his philosophy and, and his trading methodology uh, was largely predicated on this idea that every market, every financial market, whether it's forex, commodities, uh, equity market, or fixed income, but of course in his day it was more the stock market and the commodities market, um, had a vibration. It would vibrate to a certain um, rhythm, a certain uh, movement, a uh, certain energy pulse, um, and that if you were able to identify that um, partly through psychoanalysis uh, and through uh, various other um, overlays that you would use, uh, you would be able to understand the behavior of the market, but also um, the turning points in the market and uh, and so much more. I'm just going to quickly open up the chat just to make sure I'm answering some questions that are coming through. Um, so I'm just getting some questions here on um, the question is okay so I'll, I'll speed through I'm just getting the feedback okay. 
part two. So that's part one. Um, and focus more on um, uh, cycle theory. So cycle theory, think of it more as um, you have your market analysis. Um, it can be fundamental analysis or cyclical analysis or technical analysis. Um, I like to think of this more as fusion analysis. Um, so it's it's um, it's a mix of all all worlds, uh, the best of all worlds. Uh, analysis, fundamental analysis, and technical analysis. Now, um, choose whatever works best for you. But my 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 way of uh, focusing on this on this is is that cycles cyclical analysis is is very much unique in itself, um, and it can help answer some of the questions that we ask ourselves regarding fundamental analysis and technical analysis. Now, keep in mind. Some of you already mentioned on the fundamental side, quantitative easing. Everyone is now asking the question, um, what does, uh, you know, how long might this trend in quantitative easing continue? Government fueling more um, liquidity in, into the market. Um, and if there is uh, going to be more, uh, going to be an, uh, a, diff- a change trend in unwinding in, in quantitative easing, tapering, otherwise known as tapering, um, what does that mean? So this is the fundamental question. Um, the technical question, you know, what type of an effect will this have to the market and by how much will the market move? So more of the quantifiable metrics uh, that, that we ask ourselves from a technical perspective. But the cycles right in the middle here helps us understand how it, create, it, it bridges, I would say, uh, the gap between fundamental and technical analysis. Um, so I want to just put it in that context. Cycles is, is unique in itself. And it does create a bridge between fundamental and technical analysis. Now, in markets, we tend to focus traditionally only on the price uh, axes, um, which is fine. Uh, a lot of classic analysis focuses on price objectives, price patterns. Um, when people talk about a market rising, they talk about the rise, uh, the rise by 20% or 30%. So we think in terms of increment, uh, price increments that a market rises by. Uh, but we, we we rarely talk much about time, and and it's it's usually I would say we tend to overstate price and understate time, and and, th- and this is I think a, a big problem in in in, in analysis, and it's, it's a trap that I sometimes fall in, and I really try to uh, to correct. Uh, time is so important, and I've just you know highlighted why why time is important uh, generally in life, uh, but in markets it's equally uh, important to know when something's going to happen. Now, each of you at the beginning focused as to why this is good to understand when a trend uh, might uh, end and reverse, or uh, how you can use timing to understand risk management, to, to handle your stop losses, to maybe scale out a position and, and reduce your position size if, if you need to, and, and so many other things. Now, in, in just basic cycle theory, I would uh, focus on let's say, three types of cycles. You have your long-term cycle, uh, medium-term cycle, and the short-term cycle. Generally speaking, a lot of the technical analysis book, uh, books uh, talk about long-term cycles as being multi-year. Um, so the, the uh, traditional investor will invest in a long-term uh, trend. Um, medium-term cycle can be multi-month, but let's say uh, theoretically that would be three to 12 months. Um, and then, of course, short-term cycles, which can be Intraday, if you're an intraday trader, or, or multi-day, multi-week. Um, but the point is, is that when you're analyzing cycles, when you're using cycles, I would use cycles in combination. It's it's, it's uh, very difficult and um, and not as useful to only focus on one cycle. So always use cycles in combination. Um, and three is usually the the magic number. And also uh, probabilistically, it's 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 a good um, uh, confirmation number uh, to have three. Um, non-correlated cycles um, uh, telling you that picture. And also, it's a great way of having a kind of top-down, bottom-up approach in the market. You look at your long-term chart, medium-term chart, short-term chart to understand trends. Now, on this point, I just want to pause for a moment and ask each of you how each of you actually measure cycles or measure trends. So if I can just quickly get a, a quick kind of mix from each of you, how do each of you actually measure trends? or measure different cycles? Uh, or how, how do you think you could do that? So if somebody could say, what would be the most basic way to measure a trend or, or to measure a change in trend? 
because this is a question that I often get asked. Um, right. So someone's just said moving averages. Um, moving averages is, is, is the simplest way that you can do this. Uh, um, Panfi is saying short to moving average pivots, Fibonacci pivots, a series of higher highs, higher lows. Yes, certainly. Um, now let me focus on some of those points that you've, you've, you've spoken about because this is quite key. I want to make sure that um, this part of the session is practical. So I'm just going to quickly kind of talk about um, this this part. Uh, let's focus on the definition of the trend. So definition of trend, you, a, a, a trend is uh, defined as the market is uh, rising, has a, this directional bias, a sustained rise or sustained fall. Um, now, a rise or a fall technically is defined as, a, as high highs, high lows, or in a downtrend, lower highs, lower lows. Now, you can use just basic price swing methodologies just to identify a shift in a trend. So just, just to highlight that point, if I just, um, uh, just a second, get this uh, pen working, one second. Okay, so if we're looking at the medium term trend here, we can see the um, higher lows and higher highs. And then we can see that that trend moving higher. And then in a classic uptrend. Of course, the moment we get a price swing which breaks the previous swing, so here it almost uh, tested the previous swing. Here it actually broke the previous swing. You can see here the swing points here. Hopefully this is clear for, you, for each of you here. Then here you have a traditional price swing um, confirmation, uh, reversal confirmation. And then you could say, the cycle has shifted, the trend has shifted, the cycle has shifted. So that's a very classic, basic way just to focus on price. Um, and of course, what you can do is use Fibonacci to actually then alert you um, to uh, a shift in, in trend change. So when the market's actually trending up and then you get a retracement of that trend, you can use a Fibonacci retracement, 38.2% Fibonacci retracement, 50% retracement or 61.8% retracement to tell you um, how much of that re- to tell you whether you know at what stage that retracement is actually going to reverse the trend and therefore reverse the cycle. Now keep in mind that when we talk about cycles, we are talking about trends because I mean cycles produce trends, so that they're almost one of the same. Um, now I've just spoken to you about using classic price action through high uh, through looking at the swing highs and swing lows, and of course if you get a break above or below uh, an important swing uh, a price swing level. And that's telling you that there's a, there's a change in sentiment, there's a change in price action, and of course, change in the trend and the cycle. Some of you are saying, um, Fibonacci, of course, you would use Fibonacci to then, uh, identify specific levels uh, where that change might, uh, might, uh, trigger, um, uh, maybe a reversal of the trend or the cycle. Um, 61.8% of a primary trend, if the market reverses more than half, or even 61.8% or 66%, two thirds of the prior trend, that then tells you that the market is 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 highly likely to reverse its trend. So that's that's one of the trigger points that a lot of people will use. Um, and then some of you are saying, what about sentiment? Of course, you can use sentiment as well um, to identify shifts in trend. Uh, also, I just want to check. Now, the last point I want to uh, mention, uh, which was highlighted by uh, Robert, is moving averages. Moving averages is the easiest way to measure. Uh, ordinary cycles. And so the uh, moving averages people tend to use, and the textbooks suggest, for long-term, medium-term, and short-term, is um, a 200-day moving average for long-term, yearly average, a uh, 50-day moving average for the medium-term, and a 20-day moving average for the short-term. So these are things that you can just use on all your charts just to identify the long-term, medium-term, and short-term. And of course, if you're trading, if you're trading purposes, you might want to focus more on the sensitive side, uh, the front end of, of the moving average, the 20-day moving average, or other derivatives of that. And if you're more of an investor, you'll be focusing on the longer end, uh, the 20-day moving average versus the moving average. And the crossovers between these moving averages are telling you something about um, uh, the shifts in trend and in cycle. Now, is that clear to everyone? It's really kind of basic stuff that I'm talking about here, but I just want to just just – Focus, make the point that it's really easy to measure simple cycles. And that's, that's the point there. So I spent some time talking about theory, maybe a little bit longer, uh, for, for some of you. Uh, but that theory is predicated in market analysis through 
um, basic technical uh, guidelines to uh, identifying trend and changes in trend by using swing lows, Fibonacci levels, trend lines, of course, as well, um, and moving averages, ultimately. Moving averages is, is, is the easiest thing that you can quantify uh, uh, changes in trend and cycle. Okay. Now, um, oops, sorry, just one question there. Um, are the two lows or highs of a cycle confirmation of a trend change? Um, I'm not sure what you mean to pass by that. Are the last two low? Right. Uh, so, so this low here, for example, I think so. Um, cycle low here and cycle two here. Yes, I would say that would be a, a good confirmation um, of, of, a, of a shift in the cycle. And keep in mind, this is just a very um, uh, simplistic model that I'm showing you here, this, this slide that I'm showing you. But this, this gives you an idea. So, yes, this would be uh, a shift. You really need to have a structural break of a prior low, of a prior swing low, to say that the trend or the cycle has changed. Um, now, it could have happened on, on cycle, uh, on, on swing low number one here, uh, but it didn't. The market retraced, traced quite a bit, but it did not break beneath that, that structural swing low uh, back here. Um, so you would, you would have needed really to wait to the uh, second price swing low where it wasn't really a structural shift and break beneath that low. Okay. Um, there's lots, there's lots of examples I could have shown you on here, but, but theoretically I, th I think a lot of this makes sense. Um, and I'll just move on to the next slide. Now, long-term cycles. I uh, just want to focus on, on the point that, of course, um, long-term cycles do exist. And remember I mentioned generational cycles. Um, here's an example of generational cycles that have existed for over 100 years on the American Dow Jones Index. Um, and we're, here we have generational cycles, which last anything from 16 to 20 years duration. So, so it's, it's, it's literally our, the, the duration of our professional career. So it's, it's quite a long-term cycle. Um, and here we have uh, the most recent cycle from the year 2000. So when we had the technology um, uh, bubble and crash, from that pivot point in the market, we have experienced a very long-term secular um, sideways or bear trend, depending on which which we call it. Uh, and that, of course, may is still active to some extent and may still continue. Now, a lot of people um, are making the point that um, – uh, the markets were at all-time highs, record highs, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500. And so that might suggest that there's a new long-term bull market that we're, that we're in. Um, I'm not of that opinion. This is my just personal educational uh, opinion, observation, um, because um, that for, for many reasons. But uh, the simple point, a uh, simple reason is, is that duration in the cycle is, is, is still active. There's still more for the cycle to play out. And at the same time, the cyclical recovery that we've seen from 2009, so the record five-year recovery that we've been in, we look at most Western stock markets, is very overstretched. And so just based on that simple uh, law of duality, uh, at, we, uh, there needs to be some kind of healthy correction or mean inversion in the market um, uh, for, for, for any kind of long-term um, uptrend to actually start to develop uh, in a sustainable way. So for those of you who are wondering why this chart is relevant now, what it tells us about today's market, it tells us that today's market is still within a long-term sideways bear trend from 2000, point number one. Point number two, that the break to all-time highs in this market um, is probably more of a um, temporary false signal, uh, which does need to correct or mean revert uh, since the recovery from 2009, the five-year recovery, uh, is very overstretched. So that, that's my general opinion, and, and uh, I'm trying to kind of base it on, on some of these objective observations. Now, if we go back into time, we can also make the point that these cycles tend to last from 16 to 20 years, and we've only been uh, in the cycle for 14 years so far. Um, so before we have 1966 to 1922, 1929 to 1945, and then in the early 1900s, remember when I was talking about the railroad uh, innovation, it was during that time. Now, um, the point that I want to make here is look at the behavior of each of the cycles. So remember each of you spoke about cyclical nature of, uh, of, 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 of these moves. 
and understanding how history might repeat. Which cycle would you compare the current cycle to? So the cycle between 2000 and 2014, what would you compare it to? So I'm just going to open up the chat now so each of you can just share your, your views. So all I'm inviting you to do now is just to do basic pattern recognition. Um, the cycle, the long-term cycle, generation cycle between 2000 and 2014. If you were to compare that pattern to a previous pattern, what would you compare it to? So Vlad's saying 1900, Sahid's saying 1900, that, which, which is very fair. Um, Viterra is saying 1929 to 1945. Um, and then some of you are, are saying 1966. So there's a big mix there of, of feedback. I'll, I'll leave the chat box open so each of you can, can share your views and, 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 and know um, uh, statistically um, the mix of, of views that each of you have. I mean, there are many, uh, there are many um, theories or, or many uh, hypotheses, uh, hypotheses in terms of w- which cycle that we might be in from a behavioral point of view. The point, for, the most important point I want to make here is that each cycle has a different characteristic. So while the timing side of these cycles um, can be very useful for us to understand the duration of a trend or a cycle, either up or down, uh, long term, medium term, short term, it is equally uh, if not even more important to understand the characteristic of that cycle. So, you know, even though these cycles, these long-term generational cycles, which I'm showing to you, are, uh, last from 16 to 20 years, look at the different behavior, look at the different characteristics of these cycles. Now, the common behavior is these, uh, long-term generational sideways trends. I've only spoken about the sideways bearish trends. Of course, the green hours show you uh, the bullish trends. These cycles alternate from from uh, bear trends to bull trends and so on. So that shows you the duality of the market. So point number one, cycles alternate, um, and that that ident- that tells you that 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 highlights the duality of the cycles from positive to negative and so on. So this rule of alternation exists, and this duality is very much part of uh, the nature of cycles and markets as we see here on the Dow. Now that's point one. Point two. The duration of the cycle is 16 to 20 years, but the characteristics are different. Now, one of the common uh, characteristics is volatility. Any uh, sideways um, or bear correction to a, uh, a long-term bull trend is going to be volatile. Think of it as, as a car crash. Um, the market has to go through this um, rehabilitation stage um, to, uh, to basically mean revert and to, to build back up uh, sentiment, positive sentiment after uh, a big crash. And that was, that was very much the case in 1929 when the Wall Street crash. We had such a big, um, um, move down, big traumatic move down, um, of about 80% uh, capital loss to the stock market. Um, that it produced a great depression and it produced a very long-term recovery, which actually, you know, recovered in 1945. It also produced the world wars. Um, and, and many other um, uh, economic and, and geopolitical uh, results. Now, that's that's a, that's a, a very very uh, extreme example. Uh, a more moderate example would be in 1966-82, uh, where again you do have volatility, but um, you don't have big 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 crashes as the one that you did have in 1929. Instead, you have this sideways uh, market where uh, you still have um, bullish opportunities, but then, of course, you have big drawdowns. And so th- there are various comparisons here. My, my particular preference at this point is the more conservative example of 1962, because what it suggests is that the low in, in 2009 um, might be very similar to the low in 1973-74. Uh, and what that means is it's, it's, it's the major low in the market, and that thereafter, we should start to see um, uh, more uh, sideways movement. We shouldn't see a new low. We shouldn't see a, the market move beneath 2009. Now, no one really knows. Um, and, and again, this is, I, I prefer this to be an educational webinar, so I'm just going to focus on, on what we know. Um, but I, th- I think it's, 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 it's best for us to basically uh, focus on the fact that the 2009 low 
at this moment hasn't been taken out. Um, and so in that respect, it is still very similar to the 1966-82 cycle, uh, where the 1973-74 low, or the 1974 low, acted as a pivot low, which then produced this diamond shape um, uh, sideways trend. So what that suggests is that we might still see more sideways neutral price action, volatile price action, as opposed to a, a new low beneath 2009. I hope that that's that's clear to everyone. Um, of course, if we get a break beneath the 2009 low, then that would suggest that we're seeing some new type of characteristic within the cycle, uh, maybe a variation of 66 to 82, or uh, as some of you may be uh, saying, the 1900s or the 1920s and 30s. Um, time will tell, and I prefer to wait for the balance of evidence to confirm. Um, uh, speculation can be a high-risk game, um, and so it's, it's always best, I would say, to wait for confirmation. But either way, the benefit of this exercise is learning from history and learning from cyclical history, uh, not just in terms of the time duration and the alternation of cycles, but also the actual characteristic. Um, now, uh, Panafine's making a point about uh, good for pensions. That's a good point. Um, so investment strategies are important. So knowing which cycle we're in tells us what type of trading or investment strategy to use. Now, on this point, I'm going to keep the chat open because at this point, I just want to ask each of you, what type of investment or trading strategy would you use in each of these cycles? So if, if you're in the red cycles, the, the volatile cycles, what are you likely um, to, uh, to do? versus the very strong trending cycles. This is a long-term chart I'm showing you, but of course this could be applied on intraday chart, um, uh, daily charts, weekly charts. It really doesn't make a difference. The principle is the principle is the principle that's applied on, on all time frames. So um, how would each of you trade during a uh, volatile sideways market versus a strong trending market? So Hugo saying uh, breakout continuations. What else? What is, what is so important during a volatile market versus a trending market? Uh, Mason's saying uh, trade the breakout of the ranging market. Absolutely. So in a ranging market, you're really becoming a, a, a swing trader. You're, you're, you're looking to sell at the top. You're looking to buy at the bottom. You're really looking to identify those uh, changes, and it's more swing trading. Um, and trend-following strategies won't work as much. So using the averages and following the trends will be a, a good strategy, but you will need to be very um, aware of uh, fast changes in, in, in trend reversals, in, in the trend itself. Um, Hugo's talking about breakout. So I can trade the breakout, the ranging market, channel risk entry, support resistance, take profits. Yeah, um, profits is a key point because you, you could be actually trading the trend but then uh, you would need to be very conservative with, with uh, how you take profits during volatile markets. Um, and, and that's just the case because the market is very volatile. You will need to actually make sure that you lock in your profits fast in, uh, very fast into, into, into that phase. Um, and I think that's most of the feedback. Uh, stay in uh, Daniel saying, uh, stay in the rising uh, trends, play entering lows when, uh, when the trending box and make trading sessions based upon your median. Uh, if I were to know that's a trading side of box range, buying and selling stochastic cycles, for example, of what sold. Yeah, so the types of indicators that you use are also uh, important. So during range-bound markets, of course, oscillators like the RSI stochastics um, are very useful. During trending markets, the moving averages, the Ichimoku uh, indicators, so trend-friendly indicators tend to be uh, best, whereas ranging markets, it's more about your overall or oversold indicators. So great. So everyone's getting a good idea of, of why this matters. While I'm, even though I'm showing you a long-term chart, we spoke about so much just by this one slide here, uh, where we're talking about um, uh, how cycles alternate, how the duration on these cycles tend to be quite long-term, but of course can be applied to, to many other time frames. Uh, but then also the cyclical behavior characteristics of each of these cycles. So even though they might be the same in terms of time duration, how have they behaved? And we can see that there's different behavior between the trends of 1966 and 82 to 1929 and 45, uh, which tells us something about this current move that we're in. Um, and then, of course, on a very simple basis, how do we trade whatever uh, cycle we're in? 
uh, if it's a highly volatile uh, market versus a highly trend uh, friendly market. Okay, and of course, if you're one of the points that some of you made is, is in terms of investment vehicles, um, pension funds obviously, obviously you know, your, your uh, long-term investments such as pensions tend to be uh, more under pressure during these long-term bear cycles that we're currently in and, and we were in previous. So, of course, that that's also important. Ahmed saying, uh, how do you know when a market change changes from trending to ranging and vice versa? Great question. Uh, there are many ways of actually measuring that. Um, I, I tend to use more discretionary analysis, um, and it depends if you're more of a discretionary or systematic um, trader. Um, but I would I, I tend to focus more on discretionary analysis, and um, I also so I, I tend to kind of use uh, more uh, classic technical analysis techniques to identify uh, the shift between trending uh, markets. But the second thing is um, I also uh, focus a lot on the long-term chart. The long-term charts give me more clarity and more big-picture um, uh, insight as to what might be happening on uh, the lower time frames, the medium term and the short term. So to actually to answer your question, Ahmed, the, the way that I uh, best understand changes in trend from uh, a strong up or down trend to a sideways trend or volatile trend is um, by using classic um, uh, technical analysis and cyclical analysis, uh, which uh, I've commented on uh, a little bit, um, and also focusing from the top down, so from the big picture long-term chart, and then I drill down, because the long-term big, big picture chart will always give you clarity, just as this chart is giving you right now. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. No. Um, so I'll just quickly move on to the next chart. Now, here's a theoretical point I want to make about cycles generally. There are different types of cycles. Um, there are cycles, um, and this is just a little bit of theory that I, I want to kind of throw in here just, just to, to add some value and for your research purposes after the webinar. Uh, for those of you that have pen and paper, I'd write this down to, just for general notes and, and just to follow up on, on after the webinar on this if you want to research. Longitudinal uh, waves, which basically means, I mean, I'll, I'll read it out, individual pulses, individual waves within a, a, a cycle motion that differ in shape from each wave um, that follows. So within the overall formation, there is a repeating pattern of a cluster of individual waves that provide a sense of regularity of the whole. Now that, that's the definition that's on the screen, but, but, but in essence what we're talking about is that there is a historical uh, repetition in, in, in of, of, of the patterns, but uh, there can be some variation in between. So this this produces some confusion, basically, um, for the best of traders and investors in the, in the market. But the point is, this is more of a non-linear type of cycle. Um, you can identify patterns. So, for example, the patterns between A and B. There, there, there's a there's a cyclical similarity between these two points, but in between, there's a little bit of a compression and variance in the actual rhythm of the cycle. So these are very difficult to identify. Um, and so my point is it's not just as easy as showing you the chart that I showed you just before, where we're just looking at uh, uh, cycles for 16 to 20 years. When you're actually measuring these cycles, uh, it can be difficult when you're trying to identify major highs or major bottoms or the changes between these cycles, whether it's long-term, medium-term, short-term, because cycles can behave in this nonlinear, longitudinal um, way. Um, and so that makes it more difficult to measure these types of cycles. The more traditional cycles, which are um, uh, well, easier to identify, basically, and more traditional to identify, are transverse uh, wave cycles or fixed cycles, uh, another way of uh, thinking about it. And this is basically where where the cycle is more regular. So the cycle which I showed you is more, more of a regular cycle. And um, it can exist in many markets where there's a 30-day cycle in the market or um, a 16 to 20-year cycle in the market, like the one I just showed you. And it's more of a fixed cycle or the presidential cycle, which is a four-year cycle in the market and so on. Um, some markets can exhibit fixed cycles, and they do on, on a regular basis. I, I haven't been able to provide uh, the charts here. Um, I had some computer problems in actually uh, providing uh, a lot of uh, 
the work um, ahead of time. Uh, some of it was lost. Um, but I can send it to you afterwards um, in a follow-up email uh, to, to give some practical examples. But the key point here is that you can measure fixed cycles just by measuring um, uh, a fixed rhythm in the market from the price bottom to the next price bottom or from the peak to the following peak. Now, just out of interest, while we're focusing on this particular chart, if I can ask each of you, how many of you actually measure cycles? So when you're in your, in your daily analysis, if I can just get a quick idea. No, so I don't mean just basic trend analysis or key levels or uh, moving averages. How many of you actually measure cycles from from bottom to bottom or, or top to top? Okay. Some of you do, some of you don't. Okay. And and uh, Joe's saying that you look at um, uh, her cycles. Daniel, I'm very glad that you mentioned Elliott Waves because, of course, Elliott Waves uh, counts are, are very relevant um, to, to cycle work. Um, Elliott Waves actually give you more details behind the cycles uh, by actually giving you that, that roadmap, that five-wave um, impulsive cycle um, uh, uh, and the corrective cycle. I didn't include Elliott Wave in, the, in this, but of course it's, it's very integral to cycle analysis for those of you that, that subscribe to Elliott Wave analysis. Um, now, it seems that most of you uh, maybe don't don't measure um, cycle, uh, fixed cycles from low from high to high. I'd recommend that. So what I'd recommend do, uh, looking at the classic ways of, of measuring cycles through just basic classic uh, trend uh, analysis. I'd say get an idea of the time axes. Remember, I was just focusing here on, on the previous um, price time. A lot of us focus on price, and we tend to overstate price and we understate time. And I'd encourage each of you to actually start to measure uh, the, uh, the, the time span between time. Um, if you get a market which is producing a cycle low, let's say every 30 days, measure it. That would be useful information. If you knew that the market wouldn't, let, let me op- ask you an open question. If the market was going, if you knew that the euro dollar, for example, was going to make a market low every 30 days, how useful would that be to know? Very simple question I'm asking. How useful would that be? And it's a rhetorical question because I'm thinking most of you will say yes. Um, and that's that's the importance of doing this. Um, now, there's no guarantee, and there are going to be many painful uh, moments where you're going to research this and get it wrong, and 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 uh, and uh, and it'll be quite a frustrating uh, exercise. But it is something worth doing. Um, keep in mind that sometimes you can measure a fixed cycle in the market, but then that cycle can disappear. Many times I've measured fixed cycles in the market just using classic uh, cycle uh, tools, um, and uh, and that cycle dissipates, it disappears. Um, so there are many variations. Cycles are very dynamic. Okay. Now, the very last thing that I'm going to end on uh and I haven't shown you, is um, non-linear cycles, um, which I've mentioned. Now, how many of you have used Fibonacci cycles? Fibonacci time cycles? Well, 30 days is, uh, I'll show you a chart that that, uh, that tends to have a, a right, so for those of you that use Fibonacci, you can probably usually use that on a price chart. So you would measure um, the trend in terms of Fibonacci levels, 38.2, 50%, and so on. But of course, what you can do, um, and I haven't been able to bring it up here just because I've had a lot of uh, computer issues, um, it's, you can use Fibonacci time cycles. So instead of just looking at the price, you can actually look at the time. So you, um, on, the, on, on many chart packages, but including, including the one that, that I um, currently use and, and the company that I, um, I work with, um, will produce Fibonacci cycles where you can actually identify key Fibonacci ratios in time. Now, the importance here is that it's not a fixed cycle. Fibonacci cycles, as you know, it's based on the uh, sac- it's based on sacred geometry. It's based on this expanding cycle um, in in nature, 
but also in markets. And, and that's quite important because, of course, nothing you know, tends to be, you know, uh, simple, as uh, simplistic as we'd like to do, or, or linear in the way that we like to think. Markets and, and things in general, uh, nature especially, tends to um, uh, grow or decay in, in a non-linear fashion. Um, so one of the basic tools that you can use if you are able to use Fibonacci time cycles um, uh, you can just use that just to measure um, uh, different uh, cycles that, that might uh, have a variable uh, uh, cycle to it. So here, for example, you'll have different percentages of Fibonacci ratios throughout time. But what you'll notice is the distance between each of the cycles obviously increase each time because that's the nature of Fibonacci. Um, and I'm just going to quickly uh, wrap up on this point. And, and so that's that's my recommendation to you in terms of using um, nonlinear cycles, so cycles which might have uh, more of a, a variable cycle. Um, and then the very last slide, which I did have a, um, a chart prepared, uh, is this chart here. And this is what I'll wrap up on. Nonlinear cycles. Now here, this is there's a lot of um, stuff going on. This is one of my market analyst charts. Um, and so some of you are asking here about showing an example. Here's an example. This is an example of euro dollar. And here I'm using a whole bunch of stuff, but um, I haven't shown traditional cycles. What I've shown is um, some basic uh, geometry work. So, for example, um, you can see there the GAN fans, um, which basically identifies a trend structure in this example, um, or the uh, potential um, vibration of the market. Um, you can see here, for example, if you just if you can just focus on me, um, this section of the of the GAN fan is actually identifying uh, the acceleration point of the market. This is showing you the change of that acceleration point, the new trend, and you can see here how the market has uh, along that advance hit this, uh, this structural line many times. Um, this line is very relevant, of course, in your dollar at the moment. Uh, think of it as a mean point in the market uh, where the market has stopped. And the green arrows are showing you each time that that market has, has, has held that level. Um, so that's, that's one way that I measure uh, geometrically uh, the vibration of the market and key structural changes in the market. Now, I haven't covered using GAN fans uh, basic uh, GAN fan uh, methodology in this seminar, but I'm just giving you an idea as, as how I measure trend in a more dynamic way. Um, now, in terms of the cyclical nature uh, of this market, um, remember I was talking about nonlinear cycles. Now, nonlinear cycles or cycles that have variations um, can be, you can use things like Fibonacci cycles, you can use um, cyclical uh, tools that allow you to change the, uh, the, the, uh, the difference between the time duration between each of the cycle points. So you have a variation within, within the actual cycle model. And you can also think about um, certain influences of um, cosmic universal influences, um, such as planetary um, uh, influences on the market. So here, uh, one of the commonly used um, planetary uh, uh, signals and again, it's just very basic. Uh, we're uh, showing at the moment on this chart um, the full moon. Uh, so every time there's a full moon, um, which, which happens on a regular basis, of course, uh, we can uh, I try and identify important swing points uh, in the market. Now, again, I haven't uh, given much uh, research on this here. Uh, some of you would agree with this. Some of you uh, might might uh, not subscribe to this to this type of analysis. All I'm doing here is just just um, providing some uh, a breadth of information here of different types of cycles you can look at. Um, and here you can see each of the blue dots are showing you whenever there's a full moon. Uh, and you can see here the red arrows showing you um, how some of the inflection points in your dollar um, did actually um, uh, coincide with a full moon. So that's another way that you can measure nonlinear cycles by looking at certain planetary influences. Uh, that can be even more useful if you're 
mm. at uh, agricultural markets because, of course, weather has a great influence on agricultural commodities. And so having an idea of weather and planetary influences such as the moon uh, or, or even the sun, if you can think of crop cycles, that can be also very relevant. Okay, now I'm, uh, um, that, that's me for this webinar. Uh, and I'm going to just quickly open the chat for any final questions. Um, it's been a pleasure and, as always, an honor and a pleasure uh, giving this session. Uh, my apologies for um, missing out a few very important practical slides. I, I just had some really uh, difficult uh, technology issues today. Uh, in future webinars, uh, I'll hopefully be doing monthly webinars with the Ethics Street team. I look forward to doing that. I'll, um, I'll make sure that everything is uh, prepared and hopefully the laptop will be more stable. Now, I just want to answer some of the questions that uh, are coming through here. So some positive feedback, thank you. Um, Pan and Fire saying uh, universal harmony adds semblance of serenity. A little bit of uh, philosophy there. Uh, Dirk is saying so moon phases has an effect on the market. Um, there is a lot of research that suggests uh, planetary influences on the markets, and the moon is, is one of the most, um, I'd say, commonly used um, uh, planets. Think of it more as a human psychology. So planets have an influence on us as human beings, on, on our behavior. And you can think about that. How do you feel when the sun uh, is rising, when the sun is setting, or when the moon is full um, uh, on, on, a, on a regular basis? That, that there's psychological and behavioral influences. And that tends to reflect in the way that we trade um, the market. Uh, also, keep in mind, like I said, agricultural crops, of course, there are crop cycles, which are highly correlated. Um, with uh, the seasons um, and the planetary influences. So, so that's a very obvious uh, point as well. So I'd say it's two things, crop cycles, which are highly correlated with weather patterns and planetary influences. And then, of course, human behavior, uh, where there's a lot of research of uh, the moon, for example, and the sun, and how that influences the way that we behave and, and, and ultimately trade. Um, any other questions that I haven't answered? Uh, uh, which, so some of you asking me to, so Ricky, you're asking me to go back to the slide. Which slide are you asking me to go back to? Uh, I have a few minutes so I, I can follow up on, on that question. If you can just get back to me, uh, Ricky, on that question in front of the moon slides. Yeah, sure. I'll go back. That's the chart. So if some of you that really want to focus on this, this is some of the work that I, uh, I do, uh, for myself. Um, and, um, I mean, uh, I, in hindsight, I would have preferred to have showed you this chart in, in different layers because I think that would have been uh, easier to show you, uh, easier on the eye. But at least this way you can see a practical application of, of how I apply some of my cyclical analysis. Um, and, and this is more in terms of the structural side. Um, what is the chart on the left of the blue? Oh, oh uh, good question. So... Um, on the, on the left side, this is um, uh, measuring value areas in the market. So this is um, a variation of market profile, um, uh, and it's it's unique to uh, market analysts, uh, the, the chart and uh, company uh, and, 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 and package that I'm, I'm using and working for. Uh, that measures value points in, in the market, and I'll I'll be uh, creating a webinar on that um, in, in the months in the months ahead. We can talk about that. So that just identifies key. Um, uh, buying and selling price value areas in the market. So I also use that within, within analysis and encourage each of you to do that as well. <laughs> right. Um, moon phase is a little bit more difficult, uh, but um, I'm, I'm putting it there just, just as a, as an open ended, uh, point, just, just, just for each of you to keep in mind different different uh, types of analysis that can be used. Um, so that's me, uh, Ron William, uh, International Business Management, uh, Business Development Management at Market, uh, Market Analyst. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me on ron.william at market-analyst.com. So ron.william and then the market analyst um, address. Um, and in the future, I should hopefully be uh, updating more information on the forexstreet.net blog feel free to um, uh, check some of my comments there. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, of course, uh, uh, just type in my first and last name, and William 
you can connect me on LinkedIn. Um, and I also have a Twitter account that you can also follow um, on an ad hoc basis. So thank you very much. It's been an honor and a pleasure uh, hosting this webinar. Uh, any questions, uh, particularly with some things that I didn't have time to cover, um, I'm more than happy to follow up with. Just shoot me an email on that, uh, on that address, and I'll get back to you. Thank you very much. For those of you that are staying for the second webinar, it'll be my, uh, my own uh, market uh, perspectives based upon my own kind of educational observations. Um, and I look forward to speaking to you then uh, in, in a very short space of time. Thank you very much.